Thank you for staying with us. The IPOP leader told Parliament uh, that it was the ill treatment method by President Buhari led all progressive Congress APC administration that aggravated the situation that worsened the agitation for Biafra. Many consider IPOP a touchy subject. Yes, but tonight on the show we want to discuss it. I like to go there. So <laughs> I still have my guest, Mire Kanebe, and of course, Shegun Shopita. I'll start with you, Shegun, because you are of ACT Network, which is a civil society yeah. um, organization. And I remember when the iPod issue was a thing, I was on the radio, and there was a time when the NBC said, You can't talk about that. You can't talk about the African. It became such a touchy subject that. We, we, the media, were confused as to shouldn't we be talking about these, this post-war issue so that people could heal and get a clear picture of what it is instead of trying to hide behind something, plus the ban. Let's take it from there. Why, why can't we talk about this issue and gain clarity and know what is right from wrong? Um, I think the reason for that fear especially from the side of the government at that time, was um, the approach that Kano adopted for his agitation. Um, it, was, it was offensive, even to the average Igbo man. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, there, are some, you, there, there is a good way to say a good thing and a bad way to say a good thing. Mm -hmm. And the guy was, like you were saying off air, everybody has got a right to self-determination. You can't force me to be a Nigerian if I don't want to. Um, but there are laws and there are customs and there are norms of society. There are things that you shouldn't say, there are things that you can say, right? So, um, Nam Dekanu broke all of those rules, everything. There were, there were no rules, you know, anything was acceptable to him. Everything was game. Um, Nigeria was a zoo. Um, you would blow any Nigerian, you know, um, up. He said a lot of very... Um, potentially inciting violence, um, 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 yeah, violence inciting things in that run up, right? So I think it was on the back of that that the NBC and the government sort of got a bit cage uh, with allowing that to go too far without censorship. Uh, w my, so, my question again is <clears throat> couldn't there have been, because for every negative, there should be a mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't there have been a counter conversation which was more educative, sure. which could have been a, a proactive way of shutting that down and saying this is what it is, as opposed to what, just let's not talk about that, it that, and silencing yeah. it? That's the flip side of the coin. So, having said that, you know, Kano made a lot of mistakes and is still making them. You know, even with the visit to the, um, <laughs> the EU parliament, there were some statements he made that I thought, oh, you don't need to say this, right? But having said that, you can't wish Biafra away. And I think that's the mistake that the government, not just this one, actually, successive governments has continued to make. Because we must remember that before IPOP there was Masob. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, the average Igbo man has, still has that, there's still that thing. Yeah. It's unresolved. The there's still, the, 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 there's a Biafra spirit that is driven by pain, by agony, anguish for the events of the 1967 to 69 civil war. It's still there. And we can't uh, sweep it under the carpet. We can't. So I think that it's a matter of time. We either talk about this, or it's going to blow up in our faces. Because guess what? Um, the educated middle class Igbo man will tell you, you know, uh, no, they understand that leaving Nigeria is not a good option. Mm -hmm. they, they get it. You know, there is um, safety in numbers, there is strength in numbers and all that. But the street urchin, the uneducated guy in Abba, in Umwa here, you know, they're the ones. And they're the ones. I saw them during the height of the IPOP thing carrying sticks, looking for aboki in buses. Yeah. That's how um, fractitious and potentially inflammable that situation is and how easy it is for this to explode if we don't address that But, but that is the, the incisive nature of what Nandi Kanu did. And this mm -hmm. is just, uh, uh, not to take away from the conversation, but yeah. this is what is happening in South Africa. The average person who does not necessarily know the history of South Africa and for other countries, uh, other African countries, is the man who's burning people and destroying yeah, businesses. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to come to you now. Um, 
he's at the EU um, Parliament, you know, saying that blaming, trading blames, of course, making, maybe making sense at some point and also saying some things that are off. How bet? First things first, the EU Parliament has no power sure. within Nigeria, sure. cannot tell Nigeria how to run this country. But is there any thing that he can come out with uh, as he has gone to the EU Parliament, or maybe he's just doing it so they could just listen? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you as a lawyer. Well, I don't think the European Union has anything to... Um has, has, they don't have any string to pull to force Nigeria's hand to narrow her territorial inter, um, uh, geography. Mm -hmm. They can't do that. So that's why I describe, I describe Nnamdi Kanu's trip as a road show. He likes to talk and he likes to hear himself. So when he had that platform to speak to some European leaders, he felt it would be a very nice spot to go and um, maybe take further the Biafran story and perhaps just do some PR here and there. But at the end of the day, it ends just where it ended. I don't think it has, it, it can pull Nigeria's. There's a point that he made, and I want to pick this up. Um, he said that the Igbos have been somewhat marginalized, especially mm -hmm. under this administration, mm -hmm. that there's been a lot of favoritism under the Buhari-led administration, which also stoked the fire to the Biafran or the IPOP agitation, is there any truth to this? Well, I, when, he's, when he uses the word marginalized, it's a very, I find the word very, um, I don't know how to put it in context, mm -hmm. because if Buhari comes from Katsina, when you go to Daura, you see poor, poor people there. So if you're talking about how the, how the Buhari government has perhaps um, ap made appointments in some positions, there you could argue that, okay, um, Igbos have not actually been uh, formed, uh, been at the echelons of the, this government um, bureaucracy. But I don't think the average Igbo man thinks so much about that. The average Igbo man is naturally, um, um, he's enterprising in nature. He prefers to go and fend for himself and not caring who. What about the Igbo presidency thing or the Igbos being given a chance mm -hmm. to run for the highest position? of office and this is also tying to the whole um zoning thing that p political parties have in their um rules and regulations sometimes it's not, I, I don't even think it's written i think yeah. it's a gentleman's well, agreement i don't think of i don't think there's any there's a grand scheme to scheme out the evils from the from the presidency of this country power is not given freely anywhere in the world you have to Realign, make realignment adjustment to find your way to power, and that's why some Igbo, some Igbo leaders have been commending the likes of Chris Ngige, um, and other Igbo leaders who have understood the politics of um, the politics of um, realignment. You have to actually be where the power is leading, so you can actually make your negotiations, and mm. probably in the future you be considered for a, a, a place within the party. Since we still run a system whereby you have to emerge from within the party system before you be taken to the, you be sold to the entire nation. So I think Igbos should not call it marginalization. I think we should get our politics right mm -hmm. and then stand in the, um, stand uh, uh, the opportunity of ruling at the center. So you're talking but, about positioning? Yes, but I, one thing I want to take away from Nambi Kanu's uh, road trip was when he said Nigeria is the problem and not the solution. I agree perfectly. And I want to use the Rwandan example as a case to put it in context. I think we Nigerians have, Nigeria has failed to manage her history. And like you pointed out, you just we took are, my question, my we, next question. We are running away from the past. But I think history can also be a therapy. And Rwandans have shown us how to make history a therapy. Last year, they held the 20 years anniversary of the, one of the worst genocide we've seen in human history. And you see how the country has learned to, they told themselves the bad, the, 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 the ugly story about their past, and they have moved from their past, and the country is doing yes. fantastically well. And they're no today. longer Tutsis or Hutsis. Yeah, so, so to what extent, Nigeria no is the problem and not the solution. So the Nigerian government must find a way to see how to make his Biafra a Nigerian affair and not just an Igbo Interesting. Shea, going back to you, civil societies, schools, governments, everybody, parents, 
history has become something that we we threw it away for a bit and you know we had to agitate for it to come back how do we incorporate this into our history because some of us hear it as stories my father was in the thick of it he was in Enugu and he was with his parents who were working and living in that part of the world when the Biafran war was at its peak so I could get first-hand experience and so when he hears people say oh we want a secession he's laughing because these guys have no idea and like you said charlatans why do we not think put this and, and put it into our curriculum and teach it as clear as clearly as we can and not take out what we want or what we think is appropriate but let everybody see the bitter and the you know the sad truth about our history I think that beyond um, managing the narrative the historical narrative behind this um, that's very important and um, we have to get it right not just about Biafra you know about our whole history yes um, you have 30 year old guys now who had who has no clue who Morita Lama Mohammed is they don't even know about no the clue. amalgamation they, or anything no or anything they, they don't know you say Morita Lama Mohammed and they're like uh, who's that you know he's a rapper it, it's shocking <laughs> <laughs> Is that a rapper from New York yeah, or something Malibu. like what? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's horrible. So we've got to fix that. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know where you're coming from, you can never get to where you're supposed to be. Exactly. You know, so that's there. But, but I think more importantly is... Um, the emotional side of things is what I think we need to deal with. And we need to deal with it. This government has an opportunity. Um, so there's something that Kano said that I also kind of agree with. Uh, that... Uh, the Buhari administration um, made the problem worse, without using big words. Mm -hmm. yeah. They made the problem worse, so the problem has been there. But in the first few utterances that the president made, he widened the divide. You know, the, the average politician understands that it's all about building bridges, right? So, unfortunately, President Buhari is not a good politician. He's shown it time and again. He says what comes to his brain whether it's politically correct or not. So he went, you know, not went there. He spoke to the country and he made statements like 97% versus 5%. You don't say those things immediately after an election. You rally people and pull them together, right? So he made the problem worse. Now, going, he has an opportunity to be a hero. There are some things that I think some leaders, that, that a leader can um, grab with two hands and become a hero. Power the steel issue, and this Biafra matter. Let me tell you what we need to do. The government must do this one day. We must have a truth and reconciliation conversation where we bring it all out. All the actors and players that are still alive, call them, let them come and talk. Let them come mm -hmm. and say why they did what they did. The ones that were felt like they were victims, let them come forward and say why they feel they were victims even though it was a war and there's, it's all is fair in love and war is what we know, mm -hmm. right? But they still feel like we're victims. You, you did this, you did this, you did this. Let them say it out. Now, when you say it, it's therapeutic until the country as a whole heals and we deal with this divide and this easy to exploit fault lines, we'll continue to struggle. So I'm hoping that this government will be the one to take the bull by the horn and confront this issue. I join my faith with your faith. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you. <laughs> Raymond Kanabe is a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, Chegu Chopita is a political analyst is of the ACT Network. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. It's an interesting sure. conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a look at PLOS reports, and when I return, I'll be giving you my take. I'm not sure that the crisis in the country can be um, put on um, a particular th a group of people. I think the responsibility of the country still rests on the president of, uh, of the country. And um, five years ago, um, I believe so strongly that the Lord spoke to me about um, the, the coming election then. And um, the scripture says that the, the young would see vision while the old will dream dreams. Mm -hmm. We need vision in Nigeria when we have leadership of dreamers rather than uh, visionaries. Mm. You will have crises everywhere. Nigeria, um, wherever you turn, is a teary country, is a teary nation. P 
people are crying, the young is crying, the old is crying at the moment. What are we saying? Somebody kidnapping somebody on the road? Um, is that politician? No. Some young people who do not have job are trying to just survive. And they know that if they, they kidnap someone, they put a couple of costs through, um, they will get paid. They were just trying to make money. When you look at everything that is going on in our country, it all has to do with somebody wanting, wanting money. Hmm. So it's the state of the, of the nation. So you're saying bad governance is responsible for what is happening? A governance without vision. Ah, interesting. What are some of the things, apart from the fact that you're saying bad governance, are there not other things like lack of education, ignorance that is fully widespread, uh, there is no orientation, there is no history or installation of values in our young ones. So it's more like uh, we're, we're literally just on our own. Could that also be part of the problem? It's, it is, because there is no vision. There is no laid, laid out plan. There is the other day I heard um, um, Ashwa Yutinobu talking about a blueprint for Lagos states. And he did say about some other governors following it, and he expects some other governors to follow it. Um, that was interesting to me, because we can't have four-year vision for this country. We can't have eight-year vision for this country. We need a 30-year vision. We need 50-year vision. We need somebody who is going to think far and not just think about what you can get, what can get you your seat back in another four years. That is the problem we have in this country. We are not thinking about the country. We're not thinking about generations to come. And now, this generation that are ruling the country at this time, look at their age group, of their age... Um, the, 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 yes, look at the age range right now. And then, we now have some other generations coming. And they have no plan for this, that generation. That's why our educational system is the way it is. Go to any Nigerian university right now is a sorry case. Of course, most of our politicians don't put their kids even in Nigerian schools. So um, we have a problem. We have a crisis coming. And if we don't do something quick and begin to have a vision for generations to come, we will be shocked with what will happen in Nigeria. Where do religious leaders come in here to salvage the situation, whether we like it or not, religion has a role to play. If the religion has a role to play, the, the, the solution is in the Bible. How the government should rule, how the people should follow, is all in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, all the secrets that we need is there. Religious leaders have only one thing to preach, the Bible. They should stay on the Bible and preach the Bible. When we keep on preaching the Bible, there will be an effect in our land. But if we want to be politically correct behind the pulpits, then we are not going to be able to help the country. We should stay on the Bible, whether people want to hear it or they don't want to hear it. We have been ordained to preach the gospel of Christ. We should stay in our lane. When we stay in our lane, we speak to everything that has to do with this country. It's time for my take. First things first. Well, the election tribunals have finally come to an end. And we all know that um, the uh, Atiku side Somewhat lost, but can we say they lost? Well, they might go to the Supreme Court. We do not know. But I have two things to say, and I want to put that out there. First things first, INEC needs to get its acts together so we don't keep going to court every every single election cycle because INEC did not do this or there was a loophole here. We need to get the election straight. I mean, things like, oh, we want to do manual. The next thing we're using... If the card readers are not working, we're going to do, can we, number two, Mr. President, sign that electoral act into law? Let's not wait till it's close to the elections and then we score political points by doing that. Let's do it now. Because right after every election, another election cycle begins. We have two elections. There's a Kogi state election and another state election coming. Let's put our house in order. We can't keep going to court every single election cycle and knowing that the outcome will be the same every single time. 
let's get it right once and for all. And secondly, the Biafra issue has become something that we should not be talking about. It's, there was a code of silence about it. But how can a nation heal if we cannot talk about our bitter past, have a truth and reconciliation of sorts, deal with it, and we say our sorries and go back to business as usual and put that in the past. But we cannot keep sweeping sand over the issue of the Biafran War, IPOP. Let's address it. And it's part of our history. Why do we throw away history just like that? Because we pick and choose what should be part of our history if what the people want is a public holiday to remember what happened. Because that way, if we remember what happened and how many people died and the mistakes that were made, going forward, we will never dream of making those kind of mistakes. Let's make our history a greater part of us because it will help us in the future. I'm Mariana Cohn. It's been Plus Politics.